12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It is a disturbing image. A pregnant woman handcuffed, punched again and again by a San Antonio police officer. All of it caught on camera. And following the arrest of that mother-to-be, Officer Elizabeth Montoya was fired. Today, she began her bid to try to get her job back. But city officials hope that that footage will be enough to keep her off of the force for good. Dylan Collier with Montoya's path to possible reinstatement. <laughs> More than three years after last wearing a San Antonio police uniform, Elizabeth Montoya appeared before an arbitrator Wednesday. Montoya's attorney argued that her firing from SAPD in early 2019 was unjustified, that Montoya acted within department rules and regulations when trying to get Kimberly Esparza to comply while searching her near downtown in July 2018. Body-worn camera footage played during the hearing shows Montoya claiming she repeatedly struck a six-month pregnant Esparza after getting mule kicked in the leg. Hey, I punched you in the face a couple times. I'll do it again, too. A former internal affairs investigator testified Montoya claimed she hit Esparza four times, but that footage showed she actually punched Esparza seven times in the head with a closed fist and once in the side. Montoya was never criminally charged. Charges against Esparza related to the incident were later dismissed, but not before she spent 46 days in jail. Montoya's attorney said the disparate treatment of his client is central to why she should be returned to work. That SAPD Chief William McManus is inconsistent in how he disciplines officers accused of breaking the same rules. Union attorneys have successfully used that strategy to get officers reinstated time and time again. Montoya's arbitration is scheduled to resume on Thursday. Reporting downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. A Seguin man is now behind bars after being arrested in Mexico for a murder that happened over three years ago. Police say 54-year-old Juan Osorio was wanted for the December 2018 murder of 46-year-old Alvaro Sotelo. Osorio was initially listed as a person of interest in this case, later became a suspect. Investigators say the case went cold after he fled to Mexico. Seguin police reopened the investigation in December of last year after asking for the public's help. Osorio was handed over to U.S. Customs and Border Protection on Sunday. He was taken back to Guadalupe County yesterday. He's been indicted tonight. The mugshot for the Bear County Sheriff's deputy indicted for shooting and killing a man in 2020 has been released. Deputy Brian Moran was booked into the Bear County Jail today. He was indicted by a grand jury on Monday. Moran accused of killing 47 year old Jesus Benito Garcia in March of 2020 in Elmendorf. The day of the shooting, deputies got a call for a family disturbance involving a weapon. A wrongful death lawsuit claims Garcia was holding a screwdriver to his own neck when the deputy fired his service weapon at him after entering that home. BCSO claims Garcia approached Moran in a threatening manner. Moran will be placed on administrative leave. At capacity, that is the situation in the detention center for undocumented immigrants in Eagle Pass. And now Border Patrol agents about 40 miles east in Carrizo Springs will soon have to release groups of undocumented, undocumented immigrants in town there. Alicia Barrera in Carrizo Springs, where city and Dimmit County officials say that they weren't given an option, only orders. And now they're drafting a plan for how to move forward. The news came as a shock for the city of Carrizo Spring and Dimmick County leaders. What we were told is uh, they got a call in the morning yesterday. Who is they? Uh, the Border Patrol from uh, from the federal government, you know, to you know that start releasing immigrants into the city of Carrizo Springs. Soon, undocumented immigrants without criminal history will be released in the city of Carrizo Springs. Like he said, uh, agent in charge again uh, could be ten. Could be 50, could be 150. However, city officials admit they're not prepared and have reached out to the city of Uvalde on how they handle the release of migrants. We're starting from scratch, literally. And then, of course, in the border, you have, you know, charities and churches that help these immigrants. And 
Here, there's nothing at this point in place. Residents like Peter Perez have concerns. If they're going to be dropped off here, do they have money? Who's going to take care of them? Are they free to roam? Perez has become a community advocate focused on the border crisis and is asking for transparency from government agencies and officials. We have been seeing a lot of activity in our own community alone. Uh, when it comes to car chases, when it comes to smuggling attempts. But according to the mayor, those involved in human trafficking or other illegal activities will not be released. An exact drop off location has yet to be established, but according to the mayor, it could be a gas station as it's a central location. It could provide a place for migrants to eat, yet it's far enough away from schools. And this could all begin by the end of the week. In Carrizo Springs, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. We also reached out to Border Patrol for comment about this. They say they are working on releasing a statement. An SUV evading police officers crashes, leaving two people dead, four others injured. It happened about 745 this morning on I-35 northbound at Walters. San Antonio police say officers saw the SUV driving dangerously. Officers followed it, tried to make a traffic stop. They say they did not start a chase, though. The SUV hit a metal barrier, flipped, two men ejected. Both later died at the hospital. Four other men in the vehicle taken to a nearby hospital, two of them in critical condition. Another man in uninjured and arrested at the scene. No information on the men has been released. San Antonio police asking for your help to identify three robbery suspects. The robbery happened on Sunday around midnight in the parking lot of a quick trip that was in the 9600 block of South Zarzamora. Police say the suspects approached three men in the parking lot, pointing guns at them. They then stole their personal property and car. If you have any information, call Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. An Illinois-based heavy truck manufacturer has hauled in hundreds of new jobs to San Antonio's South Side, and they are still hiring. Navistar held a ribbon cutting event at its new manufacturing plant this afternoon. The nearly 1 million square foot facility capable of turning out both electric and diesel powered trucks. Garrett Berger takes us inside. The Navistar plant has been bringing on employees since last year and building trucks since January. But today is when things start to pick up. Ribbon cutting means we go, right? They've got about 500 employees now and are expecting to have about 650 in all. You know, the one position we, we probably have had troubles with is maintenance, experienced maintenance technicians. But other than that, we've been very good. There'll be even more jobs in the future if they ultimately add a second shift. With so many new workers, they're only cranking out a handful of trucks per day right now, but they're hoping to ramp up to 52 per shift in just a few months. Combined, the city and county have offered more than $21 million worth of incentives for the plant. It's opening exciting for local officials who swarmed the event. This is more proof that San Antonio's uh, advanced manufacturing sector is booming. Navstar has another property just eight miles away too. It's Advanced Technology Center. That's already partially operating with about 60 employees. And this may not be the end of the manufacturer's San Antonio presence. I mean, we have been recently acquired by the Volkswagen Group with the ambition to grow in the U.S. Will that mean that we'll grow also in this region? I would say yes, as we will elsewhere. But that is farther down the line. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Tomorrow on the News at 6, a story of selflessness and a dedication to the greater human cause. We're at the border right now. You can see it in the background. We have buses coming. A couple from Austin and their friend from Los Angeles couldn't stand by and watch the war unfold in Ukraine. They flew to Poland, where they've been for two weeks now. They've raised close to $600,000 through social media. They've delivered food, bedding, generators, and medical supplies to those in need. Every dollar is going to be accounted for, and then we're going to show everyone what it's spent on. Tomorrow on the News at 6, they tell our Courtney Friedman how they managed to gather their team together, secure enough funding to save lives both in Ukraine and across its borders. And today, elementary schools across San Antonio got to take an educational field trip to Morgan's Wonderland. This morning, elementary school students got to enjoy rides, attractions, all while learning school lessons. It's part of the parks community based instruction program. Each attraction and ride taught a different lesson. One of those lessons was learning different languages. Today we learned um, how to say um, 
um, hello in a, in all the different countries. And um, so I didn't know Konnichiwa, so I learned Kon Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Mm -hmm. More than 250 elementary school students in the greater San Antonio area attended today's field trip. That's got to be a good field trip. Let's take a look outside right now with traffic. Uh, I tend at Callahan here. You can see the far lanes slow going bumper to bumper there as it usually is in the area of I-10 and 410, but no real significant uh, tie ups, anything abnormal out there to tell you about. Check out live cam tonight. We are think about it just a week away, a week and a day away from the official start of Fiesta. And it's earlier than usual this year, so it seems even faster, but nobody's upset about it. Yeah, let's check in <laughs> with Adam Kasky. <laughs> Yes, in we Stone are Oak. quite a line we out there. Oh, very good line, and everybody's now getting their medals, and they're hanging around because we're going to be uh, drawing a number, a ticket for the big homemade thermometer, the ones that I just finished up last night for this medal giveaway specifically. So we're in Stone Oak, Santerra Parkway, Children's Hospital of San Antonio, the emergency center here. And we're gonna be back to talk about the weather because you mentioned Fiesta's early this year and we're feeling it out here, especially with these clouds overhead. We'll talk temperatures, unusually cold conditions again tonight and tomorrow morning. We don't want you to get caught off guard with the chill and even a sliver of hope for some rain. Really quickly, the aquifer's down again today. We're more than 13 feet below average for this time of year. Stage one watering and a bunch of tree allergens, but they're all low at the moment. All right, more fun, thermometer giveaway and forecast coming right up. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie Jimenez, and tonight we are shining a spotlight on East San Antonio. City leaders are holding a community meeting, and they want to hear from you. They want to talk about how they can make parts of the area more livable by adding amenities and other things for people in the area. Our Patty Santos is going to tell you about the East Side Community Area Plan. Also this. Saha's eviction moratorium ended almost one month ago, but they're continuing to help people who are behind on their rent. I'm Lee Waldman tonight on the Night Beat, how Saha is partnering with the city and CPS to provide financial assistance. Business is back in San Antonio. The tourism industry is saying we're back at pre-pandemic levels, but does the service industry have enough staff to handle the large crowds? Tonight on the Night Beat, we speak with a local restaurant about their hiring needs and how they hope to manage the busy season. A lot to tackle. We're going to see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. If you are a homeowner in Bear County, then you know that property taxes are soaring. Yeah, to help out a bit, the county just approved a new homestead exemption, the first for Bear County homeowners. RJ Marquez tells us what you need to know about this exemption and how some homeowners are reacting. Homeowners in Bear County will soon get a bit of tax relief with a new $5,000 homestead exemption. Precinct 3 Commissioner Maria Lynn Bernard pushed for its approval. At this point in time where we are having more taxes being collected that we ought to give back to the homeowner, uh, who many times that's their greatest asset that they have. This exemption is applied to the appraised value of someone's primary home and will be the same for all homeowners no matter what that value is. It will save homeowners $15 a year on their tax bill. If they already have a homestead exemption for or either their, the city they live in or a school district, then they will automatically get the homestead exemption. This neighborhood right here south of downtown, many residents have seen their property values skyrocket. And while they say they will likely use this homestead exemption, they say that in the long run, it might not make much of a difference. So $15 off of four grand isn't really a favor isn't really nice at all. Jennifer Schmidt has lived in this neighborhood near Roosevelt Park for years. She says there's no end in sight to rising taxes. I started out a grand, maybe 1500, and then now it's it's up to 4 grand. And and I just I that that's in in five years. Her neighbor, Doris Lopez, is disabled and worried about being pushed out of the neighborhood. I'm still paying almost 2500 when before my taxes were like 900. Commissioner Bernard understands their concerns, but says this new exemption is an important first step. We certainly don't want them to have to give up their home just because of the taxes. So uh, this is why this getting the foot in the door for the very first time for Bear County is critical. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. 
Property tax notices coming soon and to get you prepared, we have this QR code on your screen to show you how you can file an appeal. Scan the code. It's going to take you to an article on our website that shows you how the process works and everything you need to know about appealing your property taxes this year. Yeah, we got to do our taxes, but let's talk about Fiesta. Let's It'll be much more enjoyable, right? <laughs> is that our lady? I think that's our Lady of the Lake University. It is. It's so beautiful oh, yeah. out there right now. Just such a beautiful campus. And we're going to go from that to the north side, far north side in Stone Oak, where Adam Kasky is all over town. People getting ready for Fiesta, but those folks out there, they want a medal, Adam. Or a thermometer. Yes, and they've been getting actually, we're, we're going to be drawing a name for this one soon, but they've been getting actually several medals because, you know, with all the uh, COVID issues the past couple of years, uh, we have some extra medals here and there, and so they're getting some of the vintage collector's items from the COVID years of lack thereof fiesta when we thought there would be. You know, you know, I'll know how that goes, but we are at the Children's Hospital of San Antonio Emergency Center in Stone Oak. Everybody's here having fun. We're having a good time. We're getting in the Fiesta spirit. It's very early this year, so it's unusually cool for Fiesta, you know, to be getting ready for Fiesta. I noticed some folks go to their cars and getting some long sleeves. Hey, Olive, I was, I'm determined to get a smile out of you. Hi, hi, come on, come on, I was there. Come on, come on, come on, please. Man, I've been trying all day. <clears throat> Later. Later, right? <laughs> Young and old, we're all here having a good time. Uh, so it's actually 69, almost 70 degrees here on the homemade thermometer, but yeah, not bad, right? Comfortable out here. Let's take a look at the high temperatures across the state today. Get this, Amarillo 51 this afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, it was nice to be 72 today for our high temperature. The readings right now, for the most part, right near 70 degrees, give or take a degree or two. We're all pretty much in the same boat locally. But here's the issue. The air is so dry. So if you get chapped lips very easily or dry skin, you know, dry hands, this is the kind of weather where you really feel it because dew points are down in the teens. And that's going to be an issue, particularly as we get into tomorrow with some gusty winds. Take a look at the future cast here for are our wind speeds. And just look how they start to pick up during the day tomorrow. Take that full screen so we can really get a good idea of what to expect because you'll be noticing that wind tomorrow. And it's not gonna be all that strong in the morning, which is good because temperatures will be near 40 and in the upper 30s. But by the midday, by the noon hour, we're expecting wind gusts around 30 to 35 miles per hour. That's the dry wind out of the Northwest. And combine that with our dry vegetation and of course the very dry air in place red flag warning that doesn't mean there's a warning of red flags are coming it doesn't mean that it just means should there be like a grass fire or a structure fire it will spread rapidly because of the dry conditions and the gusty winds and we need rain you look at our rain chances only 20 percent by monday and tuesday of next week that's it i'm not getting my hopes up for this next system there will be a shift in our weather pattern then you know tuesday wednesday of next week but that upper level low still looks like it's not going to dig far enough south to really increase and boost our rain chances at least not yet but these upper level cutoff lows they're very temperamental and we'll keep an eye on it and of course update you accordingly when and if things change as for this evening, by 10 o'clock, 55, midnight down to 50. Tomorrow morning, look at this map. We're going to get down into the 30s in spots. Bandera 36, 37 in Holotus, Bulverde 38. Meanwhile, Pleasanton only 41 for a morning temperature. By the afternoon, though, you can shed the jacket and we'll be in the mid 70s with nothing but sunshine. And then mornings are still gonna be cool on Friday, but this weekend they start to warm up a little bit. Mornings back in the, you know, near 50 degrees and high temperatures are back into the 80s as well this weekend. So we're gonna be noticing some warmth. If you want the warmth, they'll be a little bit warmer in the mid 80s. Okay, I need, oh, Mr. Chris, did you already pick it? I did, or we can go again. Well, we got to take it if it's out, if it's out. All right, this is for the third and final homemade thermometer. 8051 oh, for 
Six. One, four, six. Right behind you. Oh, yay! <laughs> yes! There you And what is your name? Carrie. Carrie? Carrie Clark. There you go. Thank you. Homemade thermometer, made with love. You can hang it outside. I've got little instructions on the back to help you out. And then, yeah, we'll get a picture, of course. Yes, we will. And we're going to be doing this again uh, next week. We're going to talk about that again next week, but we'll be doing this same type of giveaway and having a good time next week. Olive. Hi. Hi. Come on. Can you say? Back to you inside. <laughs> trying. I'm trying. Olive is a tough cookie. Olive, Olive does it. not want to give you that smile. Yeah. yeah. She's thinking, you didn't draw <laughs> no. my number. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> She's so cute. Thanks, Very Adam. Very cute. All right. Today was pro day at UTSA. Our Larry Ramirez was there, correct? Yeah. What was your 40 time? Is it okay? Uh, I pulled a hammy right when I started, oh, okay. so I All didn't right. get the finish, but we'll get to that one later. All right. Yes, UTSA football pro day. And you know what? The Roadrunners were thrilled to be able to perform in front of family and friends. And in the NBA, the Spurs are at the Portland Trailblazers tonight. Coming up. After two days off from game action, the Spurs will resume their four-game rodeo, actually just their four-game road trip tonight at the Portland Trail Blazers. So used to saying rodeo when it's a long one, right? Both teams are fighting to make the play-in tournament. The Spurs are 11th in the Western Conference, two games behind 10th place Pelicans, while the Blazers sit 12th in the West, two and a half games out of 10th place. Teams seated 7 through 10 will compete in the play-in tournament following the regular season. Now, shooting guard Josh Richardson, who was acquired at the trade deadline, is the second oldest on the roster at 28 years old, trailing only Doug McDermott, who is 30. When I got moved at the deadline, I wasn't sure. You know, There's a lot of uncertainty, especially with you know me being 28 and the average age of this team is like 15. So uh, I didn't really know what was going to happen, and not playing early you know, just kind of prepared me to be ready for that for the year. But you know, it's a blessing. You know, to be able to come out here and be able to compete with these guys. And, you know, it's, they're, they're all good dudes. Blazers will host the Spurs tonight at 9. Lonnie Walker IV is out with lower back spasms. UTSA football held its annual pro day today at the race building where 12 former UTSA football student athletes worked out for NFL personnel. 30 of 32 NFL teams were on hand to watch the Roadrunners. The Bengals and Rams did not attend. Houston Texans general manager Nick Casario was there scouting and at one point he held the football dummy during running backs agility drills. The day started inside with the vertical jump, then moved outside for the broad jump. After that, we all went back inside for the bench press, where running back B.J. Daniels led the way with 31 reps at 225 pounds. Kicker Hunter Duplessis pumped out 25 reps. Then it was back outside for the rest of the drills, including the popular 40-yard dash. The Roadrunners were thrilled to perform on their turf. I think I did pretty well, you know, at the combine I did drills and stuff, but today I wanted to establish that I can move even better and improve from what I did at the combine. And also I didn't do a uh, bench and broad at the combine, so today I did it. It just felt good doing it here at UTSA with all my friends and family and my, you know, former teammates and coaches, so it just felt good. Had a great time, had a uh, even a full more great time cheering on my teammates, man. Just seeing everybody coming out here and support. Uh, it was a great feeling. Running back Sincere McCormick ran his 40 in 4.55 seconds, faster than his 4.6 at the NFL Scouting Combine, and linebacker Charles Wiley laid down a 4.51 40. Texas A&M held its pro day yesterday in College Station. All 32 NFL teams were there, as well as Edmonton of the Canadian Football League. 11 former A&M football players, including DeMarvin Leal, were all trying their best to impress NFL teams. Leal ran his 40 in 5.04 seconds and did 17 reps on the bench press. The Judson High School great was asked about his pro day performance. My film speaks for itself, and you know I feel like I've displayed myself in a very, in an extremely good way here today and at the combine as well. So just looking forward to what comes next. Overall, I just have you know a good circle around me. I have good people that always has my back. So just, just moving forward and just doing what I can do. Leal told the NFL Network that he has a visit scheduled with the Dallas Cowboys. All right, interesting. 
I think a media day 40. I think all the sports guys out there doing the 40. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, put Let's Greg on a rascal. Yeah. <laughs> Ice the hammy, I guess. Yes, I'm going yeah, yeah. to uh, rehab it, I think. <laughs> Ice the hammy. We're going to talk to the mayor about Fiesta and more right after the break. We are talking about what's happening within the city of San Antonio today with Mayor Rod Nirenberg. He is joining us in our KSAT Q&A here this evening. Mayor, good to see you. Thanks for being here and sharing some time with us. You know, for the better part of two years, we have talked so much about COVID and the pandemic's effect on our community. Now that it is not a prime focus, not as huge of a concern, what do you think is, is the biggest priority for the city going forward? Well, there, there's a few, but two of them rise to the top. And number one is that uh, we have a full, robust, and equitable economic recovery. Every family, every business, every individual in our community has suffered impacts through this pandemic that will go beyond just the health part of it. And when you get folks back on their feet into jobs um, healthfully um, and make sure that they have the proper supports around them, uh, which is a, a community-wide effort. The other part of this is to make sure that we're in a better position to withstand challenges and crises going forward. And so uh, building up our health infrastructure and our preventative um, wellness, making sure that we emerge from this pandemic stronger, that we assess the impacts in terms of the trauma and, and the pain that people have experienced over the last couple of years is absolutely important so that we can be a healthy community again as well. You know, we're, we're a week and a day away from the official kickoff of Fiesta. Uh, a lot of the regulations have been pulled back. What are you hopeful for as we head towards Fiesta? And will there be any kind of safety protocols in place for the Fiesta events? Well, the safety protocols are this. People need to be responsible. And the first and most important thing they should do in light of wanting to get back together again is to get boosted. Make sure you're up to date on your vaccines. That's something we've been saying uh, for a long time now. We are at a, a low point in terms of infections and transmission of COVID. Uh, we have been hearing about other variants and sub variants and things like that. That's always gonna be present with us. Other infectious diseases are. The important part now is that we have the tools to protect ourselves. And frankly, if, if you're immune compromised, um, you know, you need to think about the, the places that you are as, as, as you normally would uh, and be careful. Uh, but the most important thing people can do is to use the, use the tools that are available to us and have been for a while. And that starts with getting vaccinated and get your vaccinations up to date. We know what to do and it's going to feel good to have Fiesta. Okay, let's switch gears Absolutely. a little bit and let's talk about the restoration project at Brackenridge Park. Uh, you know, that plan to restore a lot of the historic structures that are there along the river at, right now involves cutting down a lot of trees. That certainly has drawn criticism and some passion from people who would like to see an alternative. Public meetings are going on right now to try to come up with something like that. So where do we go from here? Because right now, that plan to cut those trees down, it's not moving forward, correct? Well, it's, it's, it's being paused uh, for the season because once those uh, migratory birds start to settle into those trees, we can't really do anything with them at that time anyway. So, you know, the, the window in terms of getting construction started on these very important improvements, mind you, the, the window sort of closed when we decided to do some additional rounds of public input. So we're going to get that public input. We're going to see what modifications can be made. But ultimately, remember, that the work that's going on right now is publicly supported through votes, and it's it's an ecological restoration as well as a historic preservation. So all of us want to see as much of the tree canopy, especially the heritage trees in Brackenridge preserved. There are going to be um, some adjustments to the plan. I'm pretty confident about that. Uh, but we have to remember what the goals of the project are, which are to restore the ecological heritage and preserve um, the historic uh, parts of Brackenridge Park that are treasures and should be so just like our natural environment. We want to make sure that we don't impact uh, the migratory birds uh, negatively. We also don't impact, um, you know, heritage trees where where they they are not going to be an issue for the construction 
uh, and we can move forward together. So there's going to be a lot more public input. I expect that there's going to be some adjustments made, but we'll come to a conclusion. I think that everyone uh, feels good with. Yeah, hopefully there's a solution there. All right, I, I want to talk before we go. Uh, obviously, next month is the tax deadline. You've been very vocal about people taking advantage of the child tax credit. Talk about that a little bit so people know what you're talking sure. about. Absolutely. And, and this is important and it's part of a national approach to economic recovery to help those impacted families. But I, I will be leading a push with the rest of the Texas mayors, bipartisan mayors, to make sure that they that families take advantage of the expanded uh, child tax credit. And that is uh, roughly three thousand to thirty six hundred dollars per family based on income level. And, and for married people, it's uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, for single adult uh, earners, uh, single parents, it's 112500 So the eligibility is, is pretty significant and is, includes a lot of families that have been impacted. We want to make sure that they are aware, that they have the information, and that they, of course, file their taxes and, and have the assistance needed to do it correctly. And if folks need that help, they can go to Child Tax Credit. Dot gov. But importantly, this is your tax money. Make sure you get credited uh, with the exp expanded child tax credit available to you. All right. So childtaxcredit.gov to find out some more information about that. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks so much for being here this evening. Anytime. Have a great evening. You too. We'll be right back. Now to the latest on the deadly tornado outbreak in the southeast. Multiple tornadoes tearing through New Orleans, causing some widespread destruction there. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the story. Tornado! Louisiana under a state of emergency after a pair of massive tornadoes tore through New Orleans and surrounding areas. Oh my God. This monster twister barreling through Chalmette. It is huge. Another ripping through New Orleans Ninth Ward, tossing cars around and scattering debris. This is my street, man. A massive tornado racing along the Mississippi River and onto the shore, immediately knocking out power. At another angle, you can see a cruise ship passing by, lightning stretching across the horizon. As day breaks, drone video showing the path of devastation left behind by the swift moving line of storms. Homes in this neighborhood reduced to splinters, others ripped in half. ABC's Will Carr on the ground in Louisiana. In the distance, the building with the red door, that's a church. The roof is caved in. This street took a direct hit. In St. Bernard Parish, crews working to repair mangled power lines. It's, it's so much debris, it's a lot of you can see behind. Automobiles flipped over. Um, it, it's a disaster. This same series of storms also bearing down on Alabama with one reported tornado. The system dumping relentless rains, bringing flooding and prompting water rescues. The tornado outbreak spanning five states with reports of more than 62 tornado touchdowns. Meanwhile, teams from the National Weather Service continuing their long list of surveys to determine the strength and intensity of each of those tornadoes. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, back here at home this evening. Let's, let's take a look outside. Beautiful evening out there. Let's talk about something everybody's looking forward to, something positive. Fiesta 2022. Right around the corner. All right, is the Cascarón, the Canyon Cascarón, is it is it on the scene in Stone Oak? It's always with me, okay. no matter what, even if it doesn't get put into use. And it is the El Cañón de Casqui Ron. I haven't said it in a while. I apologize. You got to say it like that. Too, yeah, which, yeah, it's you okay. Know. Yeah, we, it, I'll forgive you this time. It means we haven't had a few fiestas <laughs> here. You know, we've, we've had a break, unfortunately, with all the COVID stuff. Um, and so we had a wonderful medal giveaway today. And actually, uh, a few folks have just been still coming by, even though the formal giveaway is uh, done right now and it ends at seven. Still, we've had a few people come and show up and they've gotten a couple medals on the tail end. But we're Santerra Boulevard, Children's Hospital of San Antonio Emergency Center, the one in Stone Oak here on uh, Santerra Boulevard, right off 281 behind the big Walmart, behind the Costco, you know. Oh, and check out the cool medal this year. There we go. Love it. Okay, we're going to be back to chat more about the uh, wind, the dry air, and a glimmer of hope for rain in a bit.
All right, beautiful day. Mm -hmm, beautiful we, evening. Li like I said, we are a week and a day away from the official kickoff of Fiesta. I know Adam Kasky will be along with me down at Hemisphere as we uh, officially get things underway. And you got a little early start, my friend. Uh, well, we have to have an early start. I mean, Fiesta's early this year, and we like to get our medal giveaways. We like to do them a little before Fiesta, so everybody can have their medals for all of the Fiesta events. So today, my medal giveaway was here in Stone Oak at uh, the Children's Hospital of San Antonio, the emergency center in Stone Oak, off Sonterra Boulevard. I showed you their medal earlier, but I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, some of my gear here, because I actually I had to go make sure I had it all together ready to go, had the first time in this, of the season, I had to get it together. Of course, I've got my cañon, my confetti cannon. Compressed air, boom, psh, confetti, and we shoot koozies out of it and stuff. But also, I've got my cascaron holster here. Yes, this is always loaded and ready to go. I don't know of a cascaron holster that's not loaded. Better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it. All right. Let's take a look at the weather. Today, we started off at 41 degrees, then we made it to 72 for the high temperature today. So big temperature range, and we're gonna have a similar temperature range tomorrow. You look at the readings, for the most part, we're near 70, some mid 60s in the hill country, low 70s south of town, Pleasanton, about 71 degrees. Here's the kicker though, we have the dry air, dew points down in the teens, and luckily, not a big breeze right now, but that's gonna change. Let's talk more about this because We've got the red flag warning in effect for tomorrow. And like we always say, it doesn't mean we're going to have a bunch of red flags falling from the sky. It means fire conditions. So if a structure fire or a grass wildfire develops, then it will quickly spread because of the dry air, dry ground and high winds. The winds will be gusting to 35 miles per hour throughout the day tomorrow. So get ready for that. And our fire danger remains tomorrow, and we'll still have dry air a little bit into Friday, but by the weekend, it's not gonna feel humid, but meteorologically, it will be significant to have higher dew points, a little more moisture in the air to prevent the rapid spread of any uh, fires that start. Also, we need rain. Not a shot through Monday, but by Tuesday and Wednesday, a 20% chance. I wish I had better news, but that's all we have right now. And I'm not getting too optimistic or my hopes too high for that next system Tuesday and Wednesday. But we'll keep an eye on it, keep you updated. This evening, cooling quickly. I mean, we're feeling it, especially with this cloud deck overhead. By 10 o'clock, we'll be in the mid-50s. Midnight, 50 degrees. And check out these lows tomorrow morning. Yes, those are 30s you see on the map. Bernie, 37. Holotus, 38, along with Bulverde Canyon Lake, 38 degrees. Floresville, Nixon, 41. Hondo, Sabinal, 39, right near 40 in San Antonio. So jacket in the morning, but by the afternoon, sunny and comfortable in the mid-70s. Dress in layers, have some short sleeves, and windy. Remember, we talked about that. Another cool morning on Friday. We pretty much do this all over again. We just make it into the mid 80s by the afternoon. This weekend with that little added humidity in the air, mornings will be a little closer to average near the 50 degree mark. And then high temperatures in the mid 80s. I mean, we're talking mid 80s Friday through the weekend and even 80 degree range as we go into next week. My next medal giveaway is next week. It'll be on Tuesday. So we're gonna talk about it on air and online next Monday to help get you prepared for that. Let you know where it'll be. I can get some medals and more good stuff. I'm making more thermometers to give away for that event as well. Very nice. We are so hoping we get some of these cool evenings during Fiesta. That'd be nice. Remember last year when it was in June? Yeah, it was warm. That was not nice. It was warm. That was a little, yeah, it was a little sticky. In case, in case you missed it coming up next. <laughs>it is wednesday march 23rd thank you so much for starting your morning with us one person is dead this morning after a rollover crash on the city's north side it happened around 10 o'clock last night at the intersection of bassey and mccullough avenue police say a driver crashed and rolled their vehicle into a man riding a bicycle the bike rider died at the scene the driver and a child in the vehicle were hurt 
and taken to a hospital, but they are doing okay. At this time, it's still unclear what caused the crash. Home overnight after a driver went through a home. So take a look. This is the video. This is the scene around midnight on F Street, the east side of town. A woman in the home saying she was in her bedroom. The driver crashed through the house. She says she was knocked to the ground. Fortunately, not injured. No word on if the driver who crashed in the home will be facing any charges. He showed up with gunshot wounds. He would not survive. We've learned the name of a man who was fatally shot Sunday morning. He was 20 year old Pedro Ricardo Rojas. Police say Rojas showed up to a hospital Sunday morning with those gunshot wounds. He later died from them. Investigators say this shooting happened earlier that day on Briggs Road. That's in far south Bear County. The deputies say three men drove the 20 year old man to the hospital. Whoever shot him has yet to be caught. Plan while you can. That's the message from TxDOT ahead of Fiesta. The agency is encouraging people to plan ahead and make sure they have a safe ride home. The Plan While You Can campaign emphasizes having a safety plan in place before you head to any of the Fiesta events. That can include having a designated driver or using public transportation or rideshare services. That is all our time. Thanks so much for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.